fading. Okay, today we're in interviewing Steve Pullen uh, from Murphy, North Carolina, and the interviewer is Mike McGregor from the Grand Valley State University's uh, Veterans Oral History Project. To begin, Steve, uh, when and where were you born? I was born in uh, Ramey Air Force Base, Puerto Rico. My father was an Air Force pilot, uh, and as a result of that, I, we moved around all the time. Uh, although I was born in Puerto Rico, uh, we had assignments in Missouri, California, South Carolina, France, England, and then finally Homestead Air Force Base, which was my father's last assignment Thank before he retired. Now, what kind of planes did your dad fly? Dad flew fighters, he flew uh, F-100s, and uh, his tours in Vietnam were, or out of Thailand, were F-105s. Okay, so he, he did fly in Vietnam? Oh yeah, he got 100 missions in the F-105, which uh, he was very, very proud of. Okay, and uh, where were you when you graduated from high school? Where were you living, in Homestead? I, I was living in Homestead, Florida. And uh, we had just uh, won the state 4A championship in football, and as a result of that, I got a scholarship to the University of Miami, where they were rebuilding. Scholarship? Where they were re rebuilding the program. And what position did you play? I was a tight end. Tight end. Okay. And I found as soon as I got to Miami that I was probably good in high school. I probably had all the right qualifications to be a high school football player. But once I got to a Division One A school, it was obvious that I was. I was, I was out of my league. I mean, uh, I had gone from first string to fourth string. I mean, I, I didn't make the practice team, the practice squad, but uh, I was fourth. I started out as a fourth string receiver, um, and I never progressed any any, any further than fourth string. So, as uh, as a uh, student athlete, did you have to take ROTC? Did I did have to take ROTC, and that was one of the requirements. And by me dropping ROTC when the Paris peace talks started, that is the reason why I ended up entering the Army. Once I dropped ROTC, I was no longer covered under the student deferment, and I became eligible for the draft, and two weeks after I dropped the course, I was in fact drafted into the United States Army. And when was that? Uh, 18 April 1968. Okay, well, what was your reaction to getting drafted? Uh, it wasn't good. It, it, was, it was not good. Um, the year prior, uh, a guy who I had played football with uh, in high school had been killed in Vietnam, and that was my first experience uh, where Viet the Vietnam War, even though my dad was doing six months at a time out of Thailand, you know, that really wasn't, I really didn't have much connection with the war, but when that guy in my, on the football team was killed, then the war came home to me, and um, yeah, I, I, I did not want to, I did not support the war. I, uh, um, so when I got my draft notice to go into the United States Army, I, uh, I, I was somewhat shocked. Uh, but I knew that my, my duty was to go because I was drafted. And uh, so I, I decided that I would do as, as, as good as I possibly could. Okay, so you got drafted. Well, where, did you have the, where did you do basic at? I took uh, basic at um, uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And I took AIT at Fort Dix, New Jersey, uh, and then I was selected for Officer Candidate School, and I took that at, at Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, your uh, AIT was in what, what branch? Uh, infantry. Yeah, infantry. So you went to Fort Dix for AIT, and <coughs> made the OCS selection, and you went to OCS and uh, at Fort Benning. That's correct. How long was OCS for? Twenty-three you? weeks. And uh, graduated on the 15th March of uh, 1969. Uh, went to uh, Ranger School, Pathfinder School. I'd already gone to Airborne School, um, uh, and I was still trying to go to additional schools when I found out about flight school. So uh, I asked how long flight school was, and that was nine months. So I figured the war would be over by the time I completed flight school. That that was my plan. And then when I finished flight school, I was selected to go to Cobra Transition School, which was another month. So I figured, well, the war then has to be over. Well, when I finished Cobra School, I had orders to Vietnam. And um, when I got to Vietnam, I initially was going to the 1st Cavalry Division. In fact, they even sewn on this 1st Cav patch on my jungle fatigues. But then the day before I was supposed to ship out, 
uh, a lieutenant by the name of Elsie who ended up going to our unit, Crash Elsie. Um, he and I were, were told to take off our first cab patches and put on 101st patches because we were now going to the 101st. And so we arrived uh, at a place called Fubai and uh, I wanted to go, because I was COBRA rated, I wanted to go to one of these ARA units, uh, Aerial Rocket mm -hmm. Artillery. But um, Elsie, uh, who was just a, a slick guy, said... A slick being... Yeah, it's, it's Huey. Uh, just a regular transport Huey? For the yeah, but I don't talk bad about those guys no, because... No. Because I, I wouldn't be here today without those human no, guys. I, I, just, I, uh, I know what a slick you know what I'm saying? Is, but uh, I got you, sure. Are, uh, yeah. Hitting this, they had no idea. They and might. so Tom Elsey said, how about a unit that has both slicks and cobras? And I said, what kind of unit would that be? He says, air cavalry. I said, okay. Sounds good to me. Yeah. So when the warrant officer looked at us and he says, I got some openings in the 2nd and 17th. Tom Elsey, I think that was his name. We called him Crash later because of his flying ability. I said, uh, yeah, sure, we'll go. So we both came to B Troop, and when I walked in to the S-1, handed him my folder and everything, he says, uh, you're infantry. Well, everybody in the troop was armor. And me, to, to include my, my, my boss. But anyway, so when I got into the troop, they said, you're infantry, you're airborne, you're ranger. How would you like to have the aero rifle platoon? I'm thinking, hey, yeah, I'm just a brand new guy. Yeah, I'll take a platoon. I'll be a platoon leader. I had no idea what that meant, aero rifle platoon. I just heard that I'll be the platoon leader, and that would be it. So you were uh, the trained Cobra pilot. I was a trained Cobra pilot, Cobra certified. Okay. But when I got to down to the troop, Major Larkin, who was our troop commander, said, you can make your greatest impact as the aero rifle platoon leader. No, I, couldn't, I couldn't argue with the armor major. So I was introduced to my 18, 11 Bravos. There was not a helicopter in the entire platoon. He had all the helicopters. So I found out from Sergeant Ard, who was the platoon sergeant, that this was now my, my organization, my 18 men. I went back to the S-1 to remind him that I was COBRA rated, and he reminded me that they had a surplus of COBRA pilots in the troop. There was a lot of guys COBRA rated that weren't flying COBRAs, and they were captains, and, and that being at the lower end of the rank scale, the captains would get those COBRA slots before I did. And they suggested that I go back down to the platoon and enjoy my time there. And so that began, well, May, June, July, August, September, five months as a rifle platoon leader. And I was always told that I would only have it for 30 days at a time. But we, we had changes of troop commanders fairly frequently. Larkin lasted... Not long. Not long. Yeah, so I kept having this position. So as a new troop, troop uh, leader would come in, he would say, I'm not making any personnel changes right now. We'll, we'll, we'll relook at it in 30 days. Well, during that time, uh, I had some really tremendous experiences as the, as the rifle platoon leader. And, and, and most of them really resulted in this battle of ripcord. This, this was kind of the critical time for us. Although John Yearwood, who's sitting beside me, one of the significant things we did was we captured a 37 millimeter anti-aircraft gun in the Ashaw Valley. I mean, we actually captured it. Now, John wanted to get the entire gun back, but we found that the weight of it ex exceeded the lift capability of the Huey, so we, we made it smaller and smaller and smaller, and if you know, Mike, what a 37 millimeter mm -hmm. looks like, initially we took off the wheels, then we took out the outer frame. We only brought out the barrel. Okay. I mean, we, they couldn't get the lift. They, 
the, the Huey guys couldn't couldn't lift it. Um, but I think my most memorable occasion as a as a rifle platoon leader, and I had several, but what I put in my log, the most significant thing was, is during the Battle of Ripcord, uh, a Huey was shot down supporting one of the companies that were trying to keep the high ground that the North Vietnamese were trying desperately to take. And when we got inserted in, uh, Specialist Rugard, who was my radio operator, came up to me and said, there's a cable running the length of this hilltop that we're on. And so I said, well, okay, let me see it. So I looked at it and it was actually humming. This cable was about this big around and it was humming. And so I called up and I said, I'm getting ready to destroy this. We found this cable, I don't know where it goes to, but it's obviously is a communications cable and we're gonna go ahead and destroy it. Well, John said, no, do not destroy it. And then I heard somebody else talking on the radio, somebody for the different call sign. It wasn't John, but it was coming from up above saying, we're going to get out a Division G2 team to you to tap it. We need you to secure it. Well, a rifle company had just been pushed off that hill, a, a rifle company. Mm -hmm. Me and my 18 Mary men, I can't really remember if I had 18 that day, were now inserted on this hill that a battle had already taken place, and the U.S. company had been pushed off. But now we had this humming cable. In a short time, uh, a brigade loach landed with a three-man team, a Vietnamese guy, um, a translator, and I think an E-7. Anyway, they immediately put these taps on the wire. And this is when I am talking to John, is he's asking me questions, and I'm, this guy's writing down things, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, what's being said. So I said, what are you guys getting from this? And he says, the regiment is sending a team to check the wire. So I called to John and I said, you need to get us out of here now. There's a regiment at the end of one of these. At one of the ends. One of these ends. <laughs> and I think John said, yeah, okay. But then he was countermanded by somebody above with a different call sign. And I don't have a clue who that was. But I could hear on, on my net that somebody was overriding him. Because I'm saying, hey, look. There's a regiment here. Me and my 18 merry men are not going to do well. And all of the Hueys, except for one, had gone to Birmingham, which was a POL point, to, to get POL. And they were sitting down there waiting for us. So I keep going to the translator, and he keeps telling me, the regiment's doing this, and the regiment's doing that. And I'm passing that up to John. And... Uh, and then finally, I think uh, the thing that got us out of there is we could hear these mortars going off over on the back side of the hill. Uh, and they were impacting on ripcord. We could actually see the rounds, the explosions on ripcord. And so we knew that the North Vietnamese were, were around where we were at. I mean, we could hear the thunk of the mortar. Uh, and then finally, uh, when the translator said that the team was coming up, the regiment was sending up a team to, to do a wire check, we were able to be, be pulled out. And as the last Huey was, was pulling us out, the North Vietnamese team came into view and we actually saw them as we flew over. They were looking up as the last Huey took off, because I always went in on the first one and I always came out on the last one. How big was the team? I think it was like three, maybe three, three, maybe three people. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't fire, they just looked up at us. <laughs> as the last bird uh, took off and so that was a memorable uh, that was a memorable occasion and the second the second well, thing do you know what happened to the cable afterward then, or were, uh... we we shot it up before we okay. before we before we okay. moved off we we shot it up and we brought up um, now this is an interesting thing and I, I don't know who did this but someone said bring back a piece of the cable so we took a section. So of we it. took a section of the cable, and we ended up giving it to a guy who's downstairs right now, Fred Spaulding, who was the S3 of the Third Brigade. Right. And um, he remembers us walking in. Now we both went to Evans and handed the cable to Captain Fred Spaulding, who then took it to Colonel Harrison, who was the brigade commander. And so that was a that was a significant uh, event because that was the first time I'd ever been involved 
in securing something of that stature because it must have been important. I mean, we were tapping the line of the, of the regiment. And then Fred, when I talked to him today, was saying that there was a regiment on both ends of that line. So once he told me that, I said, it's better I didn't know that at that time. You were a nutcracker. <laughs> and then the second thing that, uh, that happened to me uh, as the Aero Rifle Platoon leader is, is we had recovered a number of dead air crew members. That was one of our tasks. Really sad tasks. But one day we got alerted that one of our helicopters, a scout, uh, had been shot down. Captain uh, Terry Atkinson with a ranger team uh, on board. They were, they were trying to do an insert, uh, actually in support of, of the ripcord operation, but he hit a tree with the main rotor blade and anyway, they crashed. Well, we repelled in, but we didn't realize that the group that shot down or caused Cap Mackinson to crash was still around the LZ. So we, we came in with these four slicks we got the first two slicks in when all the fire opened up and the other two slicks had to break off. So now we had 11 guys on the ground and they couldn't get anybody else into us. But we secured Captain Atkinson and the two rangers, one of whom, one of whom was, because he was flying cover for me that day, uh, and we got, them, we got them out. But now the pressure around the LZ got bad. Once we got the air crew out and the two, two rangers then we had a fight. I mean, we, we really had a fight around this. I'm not really sure what it was. It may have been a bomb crater. I'll be honest with you. I don't know what it was, but it was it was a hole cut out of the trees. And um, it seemed like it had grass on the ground. Like it, it did have grass, you know. But I don't. But it was you know it wasn't a natural. It may have been an uh, old crater that grew. <coughs> yeah, it could have been. Mike could have been. Grew older or something. Yeah. Anyway, we got out the air crew, and now they started to. To get to get tight, and so all the gunships were were firing. I mean, I was calling in all kinds of, of fire, uh, and they seemed to pull back. North Vietnamese seemed to pull back, and when they did that, uh, Charlie Troop birds came in and they pulled us out on uh, ladders, and so we, we came out hanging on ladders out of that out of that uh, out of that LC, and then they took us down to Birmingham, and then they lowered us to the ground, and then we all got inside the the birds and. Uh, it was it was good. Every I think everybody, everybody but two were wounded. Uh, no, none seriously, but but shrapnel and stuff like that, and uh, put in a lot of guys for uh, for awards because uh, that was the that was the only gunfight that I ever really got into was that gunfight, and that was so close that you could you could mm -hmm. see the you could see the helmets through the trees, them looking at us, them looking at us, us looking at them. I mean, it was just like kind of in the movies, and I, I really thought that that was, that was it. But, but what I always knew was is the cab guys would come get us. Mm -hmm. They were not going to leave us there. And I had Mike overhead, flying overhead. Uh, they wouldn't leave us. I mean, as bad as it got, as, and it was bad, I never, ever thought for a moment that they would leave us there. So... Uh, I think you would be money too. I, I might, <laughs> I might. But the but the point of that was that was the spirit of the air cab. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we did some amazing things. Uh, we went, but I always knew that whenever I was on the ground, that that these guys would bust their hump to to come to come get me. And one time later, when I was shot down as a scout pilot, uh, Mike Ledica defied the. Uh, the C and C bird saying, "I'm not going to lose another bird." You know, pull out, pull back. He turned the radio off and came in and landed. The bird got all shot up and everything. He got a letter of reprimand. And but the thing was, is my observer and I were on his bird. He got you out. Right. He got us out. And I mean, that was the kind of guy mm -hmm. uh, that we were. I mean, uh, there was there was no rank. I mean, particularly at our level. I mean, there was no rank. I mean, Mike. I've got so many pictures of Mike and I, you know, uh, everything from playing hearts to sorry to to throwing darts. Um, so, but regardless of the mission, and we had some very difficult missions because our mission was reconnaissance. I always felt, you know, even if I repelled in, that these guys and guys got wounded. I'm not sure we ever lost anybody getting us out, 
that I can remember, but several air crew members were wounded trying to get us out. And that, uh, I felt that that was the thing that bonded us. I thought, I always thought, regardless of the cost, these guys will come get us. That's just the way it is. Yeah, uh, could you expand on the mission of the uh, of the, your, your rifle platoon? Uh, yeah. Just we, generally, what was the mission? Our what, mission what initially was, was recon yeah. <coughs> our, our primary mission was reconnaissance. When the scouts would find something and they would engage a target, we would be inserted, normally if there were bodies or a weapon system, to, to police up the battlefield. The North Vietnamese always had their shirts, they always had a, had a laundry mark underneath their, their, their pockets, so you could always track that laundry, mat to, laundry mark to the division uh, that they belonged to. And in our area, we knew that we had the 325B division, um, so we were always trying to identify the regiments where the regiments were. So a lot of our missions uh, were reconnaissance. Then our, our secondary mission was aircraft recovery. And then um, the saddest part, I think, was air crew or ranger recovery. We lost a ranger team, Ranger Team Kansas. All, all five members were killed on the team. And, and, and John put us in. This, was, uh, this would have been in May of 1970. The entire ranger team was, was killed. And, and our mission was to re recover those. So reconnaissance, aircraft recovery, and then uh, body recovery. And, uh, Is that about right, you think? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's from... The aircraft were always rigged for repel. Many of the, mm -hmm. of the LCs were repelled. Yeah, we, we repelled mm -hmm. several, several times to get into uh, to, to crashed aircraft sites. And that was always an exciting thing, hanging out on the skids there. You know, waiting for the signal from the repel master to tell you to, to leave, and it might be a hundred foot repel. And you wondered if the rope would would go all the way. To the, you know what I'm saying? Is the rope all? Because the, the the guys are sitting there, especially when you start taking fire, and you're you're on the you're on there, and you know the the pilot's going up and down, and you're looking at that rope kind of go off the. Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing that always bothered me was coming out on the ladder was. It took tremendous courage for those slick pilots to be able to lift straight up when you've got a ladder underneath of you. And they've got to clear those 80, 100 foot trees mm -hmm. before they can go through translational lift. My, my worst fear was always being drugged through the trees, and it, it never ever happened, which, which speaks to the quality of the guys that, that, I, that, I, that I flew with. Uh, yeah, I never got, drugged through the, never got drugged through the trees. I was worried about it. I was always worried about coming off the end of the rope. But once again, these, these guys were the greatest, and uh, they always got us in. Okay, so how long were you the platoon leader at that? Uh Lieutenant. Almost six months. Okay, then, then where were you, what were you assigned to? Well, that's an interesting story too. <coughs> I was promised to go to the gun platoon as I was uh, Cobra rated. And, uh, and so when I finally was able to turn over the platoon, I had gone up to the platoon, uh, the gun platoon leader, and I said, hey, I'm here I am. Here I am. I'm ready, I'm ready to join the gun platoon and, and move up into the high rent district. These guys will understand that, but we lived on a hill, and the Cobra pilots and the Slick pilots lived up here, and the Scout pilots and the Blue pilots and the Blues lived down here. So they would throw rocks at us and shoot their pin flares at us from this high position. So, and when the rain would come, it would always come down the hill and then over to our hooch. And the other thing was, was the troop trash dump was right in front of our hooch, the troop trash dump. And sometimes it didn't get empty. And also we had the officer latrines on the other side of our hooch. So between the trash not being picked up and the barrels not being burnt in a timely manner, you, you wanted to get up on the high ground. You wanted to go up where the, where the guns... There was enough to move. <laughs> you wanted to go where the guns and the slick pilots were. But when I reported to the uh, platoon leader, he told me that uh, he had already been told that I would not be going to the gun platoon. And I said, well, where am I going? He said, you're going to the scout platoon. Now, I'm not OH6 rated. Um, and so I said, there must be some mistakes here. Let me go check with the troop commander. And I got it with the troop commander, and he said, 
Yeah, we've got a we've got a platoon leader down there, but we've got all these warrant officers. But we need a we need a, a commissioned officer down there. And I said, well, sir, I did, I'm not OE six rated. Yeah, it's really not a problem. Yeah, he says uh, we'll give you ten hours, five hours dual, and five hours solo, and you'll be rated. I said, can you? I mean, I don't have to go back to Rucker or, you know, no. So I got five hours dual. I got pictures with him. I flew flew with him uh, uh, two missions, I think, and I flew with a guy by the name of Faye for one mission. That gave me my five hours of dual, and then I spent five hours doing a traffic pattern solo, just flying just around the uh, base. Two two hours at a time, refuel two hours at a time. Then I had to do one hour. I think I had to do. Did you have to do a night? Did you have to do any? Do you remember my anything? I don't think so. Okay. So last I got my flight was the last one. Okay. So I got those ten hours and now I'm in the scout platoon. I'm not wild about this assignment because I picked up Captain Sensing. He had been shot down and killed. Uh, Lieutenant Hovey, he had been shot down and killed. I picked up a uh, W. Davis, uh, he, he was not killed, but but I had picked up um, uh, an a number of the scout pilots' aircraft that were no longer able to fly back to the well, base. You weren't a rifle platoon, right? Yeah. So I had a, I had good experience with these scout guys. These guys are crazy. I mean, these guys are absolutely crazy. So I was not wild about this because they talked about death all the time. Uh, we had this guy by the name of Donnelly who was a great scout pilot, but he was convinced that he was already dead. And he told me, he said, I said. Can you, how do you do this scout stuff? He says, you just need to say, I am dead. And that's all there is to it. And you don't have to worry about anything else. And so I'm looking at this young man, and I'm looking in his eyes, and those are dead eyes. This man is, this man is dead. And then Davis told me, who was an older guy, he had already done a, a tour in Vietnam and gone to flight school and come back. And he says, you need to get out of this. This, this scout stuff is, is, is bad. Well, everything they said was true. It, it was bad. In the time that uh, I flew scouts, we had uh, Hale, Robertson, Urquhart. These are complete crews killed. Hale, Arthur. Then I moved up to Alpha Troop during Lamson 719 with a guy by the name of John Hendricks, who we, we all flew with. Uh, and we went up there because all of their scouts had been shot down in support of Lamson 719. So when John Hendricks and I reported to Alpha Troop, there was an empty, an empty room there except for a couple guys who had gotten some minor wounds. And luckily somebody made a decision that Loaches wouldn't anymore go into, into Laos. But for the first four or five days, we were flying regular pink teams, which is a Cobra and a Loach in Laos. And the, the, the Cobras had to fly as low as the Loaches, so you really had no top cover. Because mm -hmm. um, if you got up to a certain level, the 23-millimeter guns or the 37-millimeter guns or the 51s were nailing the Cobras. The Cobras were losing more than the Scouts, so the Cobras had to come down low, and once that happened, you, you, had, no, you had no gun cover. And our squadron always flew a Loach and a Cobra. A lot of the Southern guys flew two Loaches together. We just never had the people to be able to do those kinds of missions. And you might know why, John, we, we didn't, I mean, you might know as an ops guy why we flew a snake and a loach versus two loaches like the guys in the south. Did you know, Mike? It, it, was, the, it was the high threat environment we were in. I mean, each troop had, for instance, Charlie Troop didn't, didn't fly with many guns. I didn't know that. Much you know of the that? time. Mm -hmm. You know, they flew with the reserver and the crew chief at two sixties hanging out. So I got you. I guess we, we all big, that's all. And sometimes we flew with a red team too, you know, two cocoons yeah. heavy red. So what was the mission of the scout uh, of the scout unit? Our mission was truly to find and find and mark the enemy position. Indeed. I mean that that was it. And uh, <coughs> each of us had our own different techniques. There were some guys that flew fast, there were some guys that flew slow. This one lieutenant we lost, uh, I'm sure we lost him because we used to call him Hover. Uh, his last name doesn't matter, but 
hover used to be the first part of it because when he would find something he would come over and hover above it that was not good that that was a technique but not one that we we but each pilot had his own separate style when i flew with mike mike had a had a very good style that complemented his flying abilities um, i was not a good pilot i mean i was at the bottom of my class in flight school i think i was the last one to solo um, but I could find things. I could I could see things. Uh, so they used to call me kind of not good, but they called me magnet ass because uh, a lot of times I I would go out, but I wouldn't come back. And uh, uh, airplanes always took a lot of hits. And I was very fortunate that uh, I had one observer wounded in the time that I flew scouts. But I but a number of airplanes were no longer flyable after I flew them probably because of my scouting technique. Uh, whereas Mike would be very successful, I tended to be, my reaction time was probably less than Mike's and, and therefore that gave a good sight picture on the aircraft that I was flying at that particular day. So uh, it, whether it be, I think it's safe to say that uh, the term magnet ass, although it, yeah, I think that pretty much describes uh, my, my, my flying ability. So I flew those for for the, for the six months, uh, and then our platoon leader was worried because we didn't have any scout pilots. So he asked me if I would take an additional 60 days, and I said, yeah, I would, I would do that. And so I did an additional 60 days, because uh, we only had like three three scout pilots. We had a number of people who who'd come to the platoon, but when we lost those three teams very quickly, uh, they went. They went to fly other, okay. other aircraft. So that that kind of wound up my my uh, that was your my tour, first tour. Your first tour. Then you came home, and uh, what did you do then? Uh, I went to uh, Fort Bragg, uh, where I was a uh, a rifle company commander. Uh, now at this time you were a captain. I was a captain. At that time you made captain in two years. Yeah. If you played, you paid your club bill. <laughs> if you paid your club bill. Yeah. Um, and I was there. Uh, let's see, uh, I guess I was there six months and um, I, I got in some trouble um, and the options were to accept a court-martial or to return to Vietnam. I opted to take the court-martial because I thought that I could, I could explain my actions, but um, my battalion commander uh, overrode my decision, and so I was immediately on orders back to Vietnam. Uh, now, the interesting thing is, is I had a pinpoint assignment back to B Troop, 2nd of the 17th Cav. So, I mean, I came right back to your old unit. To my old unit. And the day that I, now this is kind of fuzzy, either the day or, or the next day, they announced that the 101st was going home. So I'm thinking, how good could this be? I just, you I've only been here two right? days and I'm headed home. <laughs> so we had this thing called Mars, that's a, it's a Mars phone yeah. thing. So my mom was extremely worried about me going back to Vietnam. And uh, so I called her and I said, Mom, this vision's coming home. I'm coming home. So she was real happy. She told my dad and everything. So I go back to our exact hooch that I had been in seven months before. And I'm in the exact I mean, I built this thing with rocket boxes. I actually built my alcove. And I'm sitting in there, and I'm thinking, how good can this be? And then we hear over the, the speaker system, well, so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so, so -and -so, please report to the, to the troop headquarters. I'm thinking... Yeah, because all day long these announcements have been going off, and I'm thinking I'd ask guys, and they'd say, "Hey, we're uh, you know we're going to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and that and now we're gonna we're gonna get a 60 day drop, a 90 day drop." I'm sitting here going, "How good can this be?" So when they called my name, they called a couple other guys, and I thought, "Well, we don't have anything in common. They're all second tour guys." And so we go up there, and the S1 says. Um, you guys won't be going back to Fort Campbell with us. And I said, well, what do you mean? He says, 
this unit, F Troop, 4th Cav, you're going to be replacements for th that organization. I said, well, I don't think you can do that. Said, oh, yeah, yeah, we can. So I became, so I became, I went to 4th to Cav. I mean, I, they were right across from Fu, they were right, right across the QL1, which is the main road that runs yeah. through North and South Vietnam. And uh, so I reported to F Troop, and uh, Major's name escapes me, but I, I said to him, well, I'm Cobra rated. <laughs> and he said, that's great. He says, that's good to know. He says, I, I noticed on your, what was our flight, what was our flight log document? 759. 759. He says, you got about 800 hours here in the OH-6. And I said, yeah, and I hope I never, I never, hope I never get in one again. He says, well, you're going to the scout patrol. I said, sir, I just survived, you know, the first tour. He says, yeah, but, but this time of the war, you have to remember, uh, this troop had all kinds of majors. We had a major troop commander. We had a major operations officer. We had a, uh, we still had an aero rifle platoon, but majors were commanding those platoons, whereas when we were there, captains were commanding these platoons. So there was a plethora that's my word for today. A plethora of majors, armor types. And so the guy looked at me and he said, I've got a major down there that needs, needs a deputy. So I don't think he used the word deputy. I think he said it. So I ended up back in the scout platoon. Now the only difference was is initially we were based on a beach just east of Fubai. It used to be a... Uh, uh, an airstrip where we did the maintenance test flights. Do you, do you all remember that? <coughs> do you remember where the Navy had that uh, uh, CB place and you could land and get get lobster and stuff? Okay, well that's that was our base. Tim, 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 I can't think of the name of it now. But anyways, that's where we staged out of initially and that's where I linked up with F Troop and um, and then the Easter Offensive started. And that started on the 30th of March, 1972. And uh, the troop was thrown in to, to help stem the stem the advance, and you know, those were really bad days. And I lasted uh, a little over two months, I think, and, and I was shot down. And then I did the the evacuation process uh, from Vietnam. Well, you were wounded. Oh yeah, yeah, that was a bad one. So anyway, then I ended up in a VA hospital in uh, Miami, Florida, okay. and. Um, I uh, stayed there for about uh, six months, and then I had three months convalescent at home. And uh, then I went before a uh, uh, flight evaluation board, and I was found to be uh, unfit for uh, flight, flight ops. Flight ops, mm -hmm. and so uh, I was medically removed from flight status. And then, what did your career consist of thereafter? Well, it's interesting you should say that. <laughs> Uh, pilots have to take what they call a class two flight physical. Well, <coughs> I went into, uh, uh, I was initially an infantry officer and then I went special forces. But I had to have a class two flight physical because I was a high altitude parachutist. So I had to demonstrate that the same things that these guys had to do, I had to take the exact same physical. Now, because of the damage to my leg, uh, I do have muscle spasms and stuff like that, um, but I was able to leap out of an airplane at, at very high altitudes, and I was able to to take things to the ground and and conduct rather sensitive operations uh, for the rest of my career uh, in 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 denied areas, and so I always kind of was leery about uh, you know not being removed from flight status. I think it had to do a lot with me being a commissioned officer because we used to have this guy that was totally burned. I don't Nova know if you Cell. Do you remember him? Nova Cell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, CW2 Nova Cell. Okay. The guy was badly burned. He used to come and give these safety talks. I mean, he had little nubs, but he was still on flight status. We had other guys with glass eyes and stuff like that, but they were warrant officers. They, they weren't commissioned officers. So I think, I think that was the time when the Army was was trying to phase out the commissioned officers because we, we probably had way too many commissioned officer aviators for the structure mm -hmm. uh, of Army aviation. And we needed the warrant officers because they're the pilots. 
So I think I got wounded at, at really the bad time. That's so you went, uh, you went to Special Forces and spent your career in the Special Forces? I did 10 years in the infantry, and then I did 20 years in Special Forces. Okay. So that's, that's, that's a long time. It's a long time. Yeah, very long time. Yeah, I got to go to some of the interesting parts of the world. I've actually sh shaken the hand of two of our presidents. That's wonderful. Carter and uh, Reagan. So I got introduced to them. That's probably the highlight of, of my military career. Uh, Carter uh, was after a, uh, a mission that didn't go well. And then uh, President Reagan, we got flown to the White House uh, after the capture of Grenada. Okay. Yeah, so we got to got to. So you somewhere. were involved in the Grenada. I was. Yeah. I was the S three of the first Ranger Battalion. Jumped into okay. uh, Grenada, so uh, that was kind of a kind of an exciting, exciting time. So that's how. Did I got you get to Panama at all? I did. Yeah, I'm doing a Panama. In fact, uh, I was looking at this the other day. I was trying to determine how many post traumatic stress disorders I have. Two Vietnams, Grenada, Panama, First Gulf War, Somalia. Bosnia, <laughs> Iraq. So I might have seven post-traumatic stress disorders. That I could snap at any given time. Mm. You know, I started to have nervous twitches and looking mm -hmm. around. So yeah. You know. Oh, you saw a lot of a lot of activity and basically special forces most of the time. Then special I forces mean, or rangers. Yeah, rangers. Nice. Yeah, I, I I saw my share. I know a lot of guys who saw more. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Why, why did you go that career track as opposed to something else? I'll be honest with you. When I was in the hospital, guys came to visit me. Guys that I had served with. Some of them came from across the country. I think, I think when I got hurt, I didn't want to live anymore. I mean, I was badly burned and had a gunshot wound, and I think I wanted. I think I wanted to just go away, and uh, guys wouldn't let me do that. And some guys were in worse condition than I was. I mean, amputees, mm -hmm. guys horribly disfigured, uh, but they wouldn't let me give up. And uh, I looked around and I said, this is the kind of guys I want to be with. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying, these are the, I mean, here's a guy with half an arm telling me, hey, you can do suck it, it suck it up, you know, tighten up your rucksack strap, you big wuss. Yeah. You know, and I'm so the VA hospital is a bad place to be, I gotta tell you. Yeah. But these guys, and then guys I flew with, came to see me in the hospital. And I don't know if my mom called them and told them that I was that I was going bad. Um, I don't know. But the point was is I said to myself, because I love I love being in, in our unit. I mean, that was my first unit, and uh, I had forgotten about what it was like, that camaraderie, until I was in the hospital and I had time to think about it, and I'm thinking, you know, these are the best guys I'll ever know. I mean, I've known these guys for 40 plus years. I mean, uh, so I think well, that's... Well, we've gone through, I've, I've gone through, I've gone through two. Uh, so, so when you ask that question, I think it's because of them. Uh, what does Shakespeare say? We few, we happy few, we band, band of brothers. Yeah, I think that's know. true, Mike. I know. Yeah. Uh, in fact, St. Christmas Day is coming up. Yeah, that's exactly right. Days, yeah. 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 So yeah. it's because of them that I, I stayed in the military. And I never regretted a single day of it. Uh, there was good days, and of course there was always some sure. bad days. But being with these guys, I mean, these are my brothers. You were with the warriors and not the bureaucrats. Yeah. I'm with the centurions. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. These guys are warriors. Yeah. And so I feel comfortable being with them. Now, we can't, even though we've gone through wives and all that stuff, and I have a bond with these guys that cannot be broken. I know exactly what you're you mean. You know what I'm saying? So if they asked me to do something and it was in my power, I would do it. I would drop whatever I'm doing to be with them because that's what they would do for me. So for me, the Army, and, and once I became a contractor, it broke my heart to be with with guys that had no, no longer had a heart, that no longer would display the courage that you needed to be able to do sensitive things. I mean, I never ever got the feeling that I got with yeah. these guys. So, 
That's a long answer, but uh, it's because of them that, that I did what I did. Well, hey, thank you for the interview, it's, uh, and thank you for your service. Thank Sorry, you, Mike. Let me shut the camera off now. I'll tell you a funny story about